got nothing. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> hey. So we are continuing our standards-based fun fest. We uh, just did a session on SAML and OpenID Connect, which would be our Federation 201 class. We have a Federation 101 class, which if you haven't watched that, stop now and go watch that first. Then watch the OpenID Connect and SAML one, and then come to this video. It's getting complex. Isn't there an authorization 101 as well? There somewhere? is. There is, yeah. Which probably you should see. Why don't you see all of the 101 series, then come back? Yes, that's a good touche. Right. So we're going to talk about OAuth. OAuth. And UMA. Yes. Let's do it. Okay. So OAuth, which is actually called OAuth 2. Mm -hmm. And OAuth 1 was there. We don't like it anymore. It's gone. You don't forget about that. OAuth 1. Yeah. So OAuth 2 is what we typically refer to as OAuth. Right? So I guess let's have a look at the use case as to why we actually need it. Mm -hmm. right? So an interesting use case that we've got, and in fact, we do it right here in this company. Mm -hmm. We have a financial services, FinServe, which is maybe your American Express card, right? And American Express, and you've got that into the account. We have another application over here, which is Expensify. We all use Expensify, and Expensify says, it's really convenient. I can go and have a look at your Amex account, and I'll bring all of those expenses in. So how do we do that? Mm -hmm. Well, right now, what you do is you go to Expensify, and you say, here's everything you need to do to log in as me to my American Express account. Please be nice. And so Expensify logs in as you to American Express and gets your information. Okay? Not good. Kind of, of feels a little creepy, right? Yeah. It's, you don't want to do that. So what I really want to be able to do is I want to be able to go to American Express and say, give me something that I can give to Expensify so that when they come and log in using that, you'll know that I've said it's okay. Mm -hmm. right? That's essentially what I want to do. So I'm going to get it token from here that I can now give back to here, and when Expensify makes it with whatever token I gave it, American Express says, ah, this is a, it's a valid, it's an authorized access, somebody's trying to get Alan's information and it's all valid. Right? That is exactly the use case for OAuth2. Right. This is an OAuth2 token. Mm -hmm. right? And it's really there so that we can delegate the ability to access resources that I own, yeah. or access resources on my behalf. Mm -hmm. right? And that's really what OAuth 2 is all about. Right. People see this often when, when they're using kind of a social provider to access another service and you get kind of that, that page that pops up saying, hey, you're using your Facebook profile, is it okay that we actually give some of this stuff to your photo sharing mm -hmm. service? and they click OK. And that page would actually be sort of right here as you're giving that token. Yeah, correct. That, that's basically an OAuth flow. It's an OAuth flow. Okay. So interestingly with it, mm -hmm. exact same use case is really fun when we start talking about web services. Mm -hmm. Earlier on, we spoke about machine-to-machine -machine communication. Mm -hmm. right? And if you think about it, machine-to-machine -machine communication. Mm -hmm. So OAuth is actually used a lot in machine-to-machine -machine unit communication to validate or, or authorize the requests coming in. Yeah, that makes total sense. So when you, we talked in another video, which you can go watch on... Um, you should go watch. ...on uh, uh, microservices, um, we talked about all the different services within an enterprise validating that they should be able to talk to each other. Absolutely. And that can all be done with OAuth tokens and using the OAuth standard to ensure that that service-to-service -service interaction is okay. Absolutely. That's pretty powerful. It is. It's a very powerful story. So, So we talked about OAuth 2 and kind of essentially uh, these authorization use cases. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes when I hear people talk about OAuth, they talk about scopes. What's a scope? Scopes are simply um, labels. Mm -hmm. And instead of just coming up with a token that says you can access my account, I may have to scope that and say, you can only access my account for everything that I've labeled travel mm -hmm. or everything that I've labeled business. Right. right? And as long as the, the service provider or the, the service understands what that scope means, 
it can limit the access to that scope. So it's a way of limiting the token to give you, maybe you might give read access or read and write to different scopes. Yeah. Okay. So we've heard a lot of people talk about user managed access and, and uh, kind of uh, externalized authorization, ways of sharing data about oneself. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how that's connected to OAuth? Yes. So when we look at this diagram, right, the key thing about OAuth is that it enables this application or this machine to access this resource on my behalf, mm -hmm. right? What UMA does is it's an extension, or it's a profile of OAuth2, that enables me to actually give access to this resource to somebody else. Mm -hmm. not, a, not a machine that's going to do it, but actually give it to a person who can access that resource on my behalf. So if you think about OAuth as enabling the sharing of information, it's about me sharing information with my other resources. That could right. be from like a financial services company, it could be Expensify, it could be something else. So I would actually look at it as OAuth is not sharing information, mm -hmm. but it's allowing other services to access my information mm -hmm. on my behalf. Right. Whereas UMA extends that to sharing the information with other people. So now I want a standards-based way built on top of OAuth. Yes to basically say, hey, I want to share my medical information with Alan or my tax information with Alan. Mm -hmm. UMA is what enables me to do that in a standards-based way. UMA gives us a way to do that. One of the interesting words that often comes up with UMA is delegation, mm -hmm. right? And so if you think of the use case of, I'm an elderly parent, it's difficult for me to get down to the pharmacy, I want to delegate to my son the ability to handle all of my medical prescriptions. Right? That's a very valid use case. And really what I'm doing is I want to be able to give access to my son the ability to access the resource, which is my prescriptions. Right. Right. It's the same basic problem that we have with that. So UMA extends out by bringing a third player into this game, which is a requesting party. In this case, it's all done on my behalf. So interestingly, the most important piece that I hear about this is this is a way to create mashups across digital services. Sure. It's a way to have identity traverse those services in a way where you can do cool things with them that you couldn't do before in the old siloed identity days. Right. It gives us a way to be able to propagate out authorization to access information, authorization to access on my behalf, and authorization for other people to be able to access it and obviously to share themselves. Right. Okay. That that's Oh well, Uma. Uma. Yeah. Thank you. Peace. Oh,